forestry in Cambridgeshire uh, as very much as a commercial operation. Um, so that's just by way of introduction. What I've been uh, uh, asked to talk about uh, is a sort of more about the economics of agroforestry. And, and I'm really pleased, as Steve has already said, that we must be on trend because agroforestry is now, as we speak, being planted on the arches. Uh, uh, nice, to, uh, nice to see that happening under what some would consider the original social media in, in uh, agriculture. So <clears throat> what I've been asked to cover uh, is to look at the economics, uh, what the establishment costs might be, um, some examples of agri agroforestry systems in practice, uh, what grants they are, there are for agroforestry, and uh, how does agroforestry fit into uh, our sort of changing political uh, landscape. I uh, say so quite a lot to cover in 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll try and zip through. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of economics, really it comes down to uh, what your agroforestry system might look like. Uh, and the challenge here is that uh, for many of you, uh, as farmers or land managers, you'll all have different objectives and, uh, and different wants and needs and timescales. So <clears throat> depending on the system layout and design and also the, uh, uh, the, the, maybe the livestock type of it, silvopastoral or the tree choice, uh, the economics on which you're going to base uh, the, the output from your system can be hugely varied. Um, it might be that you've got a, a quite a simple system uh, like I have on my farm with, with combinable crops and, uh, and in my case fruit trees, or it might be you're combining a whole range of, of different, uh, say, vegetable crops uh, and, uh, uh, and grassland or livestock with a whole range of different trees. So it can be a simple system or it can be a very complex system, and of course that's all going to have an impact on the investment required, the establishment costs and the economic returns uh, that you're likely to achieve. So lots of, uh, lots of things that impact upon that, uh, that economic return, uh, not only in terms of the system design uh, and the species that you use, but also the, uh, the management of those systems in terms of how those trees are, are pruned and managed and the weed control that happens uh, throughout the, the growth cycle of that trees and the protection costs uh, in, t in terms of protecting those trees from pests, diseases and, uh, and livestock components. So just a quick slide here. This is uh, some work done actually in France on a poplar system. Uh, and you can see quite different pruning management at different heights, own, uh, partly for, for light interception uh, and partly for, for growth of the trees. But that's going to have quite a, quite a big impact on, on the management costs in terms of how frequently and to what extent you prune those trees. Uh, Steve's already explained the sort of concept of land equivalent ratios. Uh, in terms of growing agroforestry is a combination of trees and uh, uh, either pastoral or crops um, compared to how they're grown separately and uh, land equivalent ratios reported sort of up to sort of 1.4 um, and uh, a big piece of work done by headed up by Cranfield University over a number of years looking at land equivalent ratios really reported uh, productivity increases of anywhere between at worst no better, i.e. one, uh, best 40, but the majority of those sort of 42 tree crop combinations around the 1.2 or 1.3, which is 20 or 30% more productive. <clears throat> but remember, we're talking about a very dynamic system. We've got components but, uh, at the ground level, but we've got those three dimensional components that Steve has already talked about, and, and, and they are dynamic in time. So the, the, the change that we have to consider in terms of uh, uh, budgeting and economics is not a static component. How that compares at the beginning of the system or the rotation of those trees will be very different to how it might be in five or 10 or even 30 or 40 years hence. So there's a long-term piece of work here actually reporting from China. What you can see is that the, the crop components, uh, which are the, the, the um, the wheat and the, the maize and the beans and the cotton at the bottom here, uh, they, they are slightly impacted by the, the tree competition, which is the, uh, uh, the, red com uh, the, the, comp the, the line coming up here. But as the tree grows, those, that competition is more than compensated for by the output of, of the tree components. So it's a dynamic system. 
So in terms of budgeting, that makes it quite interesting but quite challenging in terms of economic output because it's a constantly moving feast. So in terms of uh, uh, thinking about um, establishment and, and some examples, uh, what, I, what I'm just going to share with you is a quite well-established and respected system, Martin Wolf's system over at uh, Wakelands in Suffolk. Uh, he's, uh, this example has actually got uh, short rotation coppice willow, uh, growing combinable crops and root crops in between, based on a sort of three metre strip of trees and then a 12 metre alley in between. Um, when we're considering establishment costs, you need to consider about things like protection and weed control. And there's some choices that you've got to make. So an example here might be that if you, if you chose the, perhaps the ethical uh, uh, choice of a jute under layer around the trees for weed control, that could cost you up to uh, £1.59 per metre uh, of jute or uh, you know, £1.70 per, per metre uh, run. Whereas if you cho chose perhaps the, the less eth ethical choice of black plastic, that's down to 45 pence a metre. So quite a big impact on establishment, on weed control, uh, d just in terms of your own choice, in terms of what, what you want to try and achieve. N neither one of those is right or wrong. It will come down to the, uh, the budgetary choice and the, and the choice that you make. And the same with the species. So here we've got willow trees at 15 pence a piece and all the trees at 25 pence a piece. You start scaling those up to thousands of numbers, that has quite an impact in terms of your inve initial investment costs. When we come to management, uh, how you choose to manage those trees uh, will depend on, on the scale. So if you cho chose at one end, let's say, a chainsaw and a small chipper, fairly manual operation, your costs are going to be around uh, nine, ten pounds per cubic meter of tree that you, you might harvest. Whereas if you were to perhaps use a, a felling head on a on a, uh, uh, a mechanized uh, felling machine, uh, you could have costs down to, to less than sort of uh, half a pound, fifty pence per meter cubed. But you're going to have to probably spend twenty thousand pound on a machine to achieve those economies of scale. So, in terms of economics, working out the scale of your operation and what kind of investments you can afford, it has quite a big, uh, quite a big impact on the, the economic uh, the performance of the system. In terms of uh, productivity of such a type of system, so here we've got willow and hazel systems. Um, you can see quite big differences from these two tables in terms of um, uh, biomass production and also the energy produced throughout the different years that those, those crops are growing over a period of time, and that will fluctuate. It's a dynamic system. Those trees become more productive uh, uh, after the first few years, and then they wane a few years later on as part of that production cycle. So when you're budgeting, again, it's a dynamic system that you have to try and work with, and you need to think about doing those budgets over a number of years. Uh, equally, comparing different systems here in terms of maturity and rotation and replanting, four different systems here uh, producing quite variable uh, amounts of biomass uh, at different rotational grow, uh, years of growth. You need to build that into budgeting when you're actually looking at uh, those type of systems. So um, repeat those budgets for different years. Don't look at single, single uh, state budgets. Uh, just, just at one point in time. I think that's the, the point I'm trying to make. You've got to look at it as a dynamic system. Examples in practice. Uh, agroforestry means many different things to different people. And just a few slides of different examples. Uh, whether that's, a, a, you know, you could say that in England, we are a lowland agroforestry system by its very nature. We have hedges, we have trees in our landscape. It's just about uh, thinking about an economic return from those trees and those hedges as part of our system. But it could be a silvopastoral system with grazed livestock, um, as we've heard about this morning from silvopastoral systems. It could be woodland grazing. You could start from the other end, actually thin woodland, and bring livestock into that system rather than actually planting. Uh, uh, we've heard a little bit this morning about tree forage and, and the, the benefit that some of those... Uh, uh, um, uh, the benefits that can, can be derived from feeding uh, foliar-based products to, to animals. How do you build that into budgets as part of their diet? A bit more difficult to actually budget some of those. Um, it could be a poultry system. 
Uh, uh, there are certainly well-documented benefits in terms of poultry uh, productivity increases from actually associating that productivity of, of birds with, with tree canopy in terms of better welfare. Or it could be, could be cropping-based systems um, mixing combinable or vegetable crops uh, uh, with, with trees, as we've heard about from Steve already. And it's not just lowland. There's, there's plenty of research from upland situations, as we heard from uh, a colleague this morning in, in Scotland, um, where uh, improving the, 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 um, uh, the habitat for, or the, the area for livestock to actually grow in, so they can put more energy into growth ra and rather than just, um, uh, just, just maintaining their own sort of body temperatures. So building in to your budget, budgetary and economic models, uh, the growth increased or improved growth rates of livestock because of you know, actually putting them under shelter has got to form part of that, that, uh, that conversation. Um, I know I'm running short of time, so I'll wish through a couple of these. Um, we need to think about agroforestry use not only on a single farm basis, but also on a catchment scale and what it can contribute from an economic perspective to, to things like catchment management and riparian management and water management, as well as actually, as our political leaders said yesterday, actually managing soil and what, what might uh, agroforestry be able to do in terms of protecting soil better. We could be getting payments for protections of soil in terms of ecosystem services and agroforestry is well aligned to do that. Um, okay. There are other services as well. So Tim Downs, a, a farmer up in Shropshire, uh, he's planted uh, agroforestry systems and he's using them for browse. How do, within our eco economic models, we should be including an, an, incre uh, an increased nutritional benefit to those livestock uh, that, uh, that we might be able to, to think about including in, um, in, our, in, in our sort of budgets as well? Um, grant funding, uh, other than to say, really, there isn't a lot of grant funding for agroforestry at the moment. Um, other than there is money through people like the Woodland Trust and other NGOs to help grant gr establish agroforestry systems. Um, but from central government at the moment, there isn't any grant funding, but we are, we, are, we are hopeful, and I believe government are mindful to include agroforestry in the new ELMS programme and support it as, uh, as, a, uh, as a valid land use for, for establishment. Where we stand at the moment, there is, there is money within the CAP but uh, under Pillar 2, but that hasn't been adopted by, by, by uh, uh, English governments. But there are other opportunities. There are opportunities outside of the NGO sector to look at things like carbon offsetting uh, uh, for tree establishment, and there are opportunities to perhaps work with, uh, engage with people like water companies to look at how we might be able to use trees and agroforestry to help protect water sources and ask them to look at funding, funding mechanisms to uh, support agroforestry planting. How does agroforestry fit into sort of agricultural policy and outcome-based schemes? I think it's well-placed. I think uh, those of you that are interested in agroforestry should uh, engage with DEFRA and Natural England and show your, express your interest in agroforestry to make sure that they build it into, the, into future programmes. Okay, I've been told I've run out of time. So I'm gonna stop at that point.